brilliant. Thank you everyone for posting in the chat. I can see that we've um, we've leveled out in terms of numbers, so I'll get started. Um, again, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us this morning for this conversation. I'm very excited. I'm joined by Anna Ambrose, Director of the London Progression Collaboration and Paul DeVoy, CEO of Investors in People. And by way of introduction to myself, I'm Beth. I'm the um, People Lead at Investors in People as well. So today we'll be talking all things levy. Um, we'll be asking why you should be thinking about apprenticeships right now, especially with everything else that's going on, um, how to support apprentices on existing schemes and how our two organisations can support you with both. Um, it's very much going to be quite relaxed and informal, so do get involved. Um, you've either got the option of the Q&A section at the bottom, so you can pop in any questions that come up throughout, um, or just pop any comments in the chat function as well. Um, if you've got things that you're liking that you're hearing or you want to kind of get involved, um, please do pop that in there. So without um, any further ado, I'll dive straight in by starting a poll for you. So hopefully you can now see that popped up on your screen. How much do you know about apprenticeships? A lot, a little or not a lot? I'll just wait a little bit for everyone to, uh, to pop some answers on there. Fab. So we've got 39% know a lot about apprenticeships. We've got 58% the majority saying a little and 3% saying not a lot. Um, I think I personally would probably put myself somewhere between a little and a lot. Um, the more I know, the more I realise I don't know. But I'm sure we're going to have a really enlightening conversation today. So I'll get straight stuck in. Um, I'll go to Paul first for this question. What are your top three benefits of earn while you learn or apprenticeship schemes? Yeah, well, I can talk from personal experience because um, when I left school, I, I got a job in the, I had a YTS actually to start off with, and then I got a job in the civil service. Um, and that was a classic example of learning while you earn. I, I studied at night and did an HNC in business studies and then went on to do a postgrad in HR um, and I worked during the day. So I was getting practical learning on the job during the day and at night I was getting uh, formal education. And those two things combined meant that I got career progression um, and I got the academic underpinning of that as well, um, which for me was the, the basis of the, in my career progression from then on. Um, so, it, and obviously, I mean, I'm talking a very long time ago, there wasn't um, student debt <laughs> then, but only 5% of people went to university when I left school. Um, now 50% do. Uh, and I think more and more people now are looking at the balance between taking on debt as a student versus the more vocational route where you learn and you earn at the same time. And I think there's very few downsides from learning and earning. Um, and if, from, from an employer point of view, We've had excellent experience of bringing in apprentices. They understand the culture of your organisation. They grow with your organisation. And if you invest a bit in the academic underpinning of what they need to know, you will get, a, and all the research shows us, you'll get a very productive and loyal um, employee. So for me, from the employer side of it and from the individual side of it, it's a win-win. And I can you know, vouch for that through personal experience. Thanks, Paul. And I'll hand over to Anna now for her top three. Great, thank you. Um, and I think I think Paul's touched on some of the really important things. I think that opportunity for employers to bring skills into their business or to upskill existing staff whilst being able to shape that individual's learning to the culture and the specific processes of the business. Um, you know, you're not just saving recruitment costs by um, by doing that. You're you're really um, investing in a way which develops skills and improves productivity. I think there's, you know, also from the business perspective, there's uh, great um, data and feedback around the impact of apprenticeships on improving staff retention, on motivation and commitment. Um, and we've heard fantastic stories from some of the businesses we've worked with who, you know, working in sectors where retention, particularly at the kind of starter levels, is a real challenge of kind of turning a 75% churn rate on its head to turn that into a 75% retention rate, which kind of speaks for itself really you can't can't argue with that I think um but then I think my kind of third 
third sort of benefit to highlight is is the sort of wider benefits of apprenticeships and the sort of responsible business imperative to think about the impact that you're having as an employer both on individuals and on the business ecosystem that you're part of so we've heard from Paul how powerful a route to progression in work apprenticeships and other forms of learning that mix uh, learning and working can be um, and there was uh, you know great data on that from the Social Mobility Foundation earlier in the year um, but also so, you know, as a business, apprenticeships, I think, are a real opportunity to think about contributing skills to your wider sector or the occupational yeah. area, that kind of ecosystem in which if your business is going to thrive, you need that wider ecosystem to be thriving as well. And we've heard, again, fantastic examples of businesses who are perhaps taking on more apprentices than they know that they can themselves keep because they know they can support those apprentices to offboard into that wider ecosystem where they have strong relationship and know that their skills will be kind of for the benefit of everybody. Yeah, I, think, I, think they're, I think they're really po powerful points that Anna makes. That I think the whole concept of overtraining is, if you look at it on the basis of industries, um, if larger employers can overtrain in order to create skilled um, employees for their supply chain in the wider sector, then it improves the skill equilibrium right across the whole sector that everyone benefits from. And every boat rises in a rising tide. So, you know, if you, if you, as an employer, if you think above your own in, your own um, business and think about the wider sector, it, it has it has huge benefits. Had a, had a fantastic conversation yesterday actually with a business with almost sort of the opposite of that approach almost who can't themselves offer many kind of starter level roles in their sector but are using levy transfer to support businesses who can actually take people from you know straight from school and knowing that actually that's supporting not just those individuals but also people who will probably be able to progress into those higher level roles in their own business. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. So really having um, while you learn schemes or apprenticeship schemes is one of those unique opportunities to impact individual lives, businesses, wider industries, and actually the whole kind of society as a whole, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, so I'll go to you, Paul, now to just um, tell, tell me and tell the audience a little bit more about what Investors in People is doing to support employers with apprenticeship schemes. Yeah. I mean, our, our stock and trade as, as an organisation is to develop frameworks that help employers understand what good looks like in a particular subject area. So the classic thing that everyone knows us for is our investors and people accreditation. Uh, but we do much more than that now. Um, and a couple of years ago, we were asked by the Department of Education to create a framework that describes what excellence looks like from an employer perspective for running an apprenticeship scheme. So, <coughs> excuse me. We undertook a large uh, piece of research to, and we talked to lots of employers, um, we talked to training providers, we talked to apprentices, very importantly, um, we talked to the Department of Education, all the, all the plethora of stakeholders that are in the apprenticeship space, and we worked together to define what does good look like in terms of how an employer offers an apprenticeship. And we've turned that into a framework that we're now um, launching to help employers assess themselves against that framework to see the gaps and the strengths that they've got in their apprenticeship programme so that they can build the quality of the apprenticeship. Because we believe every apprentice has the right to an excellent apprenticeship scheme. And we also believe that every employer wants to provide the best scheme that they possibly can. So what we want to do is to help facilitate that by providing a framework and a process through which organisations can assess themselves to start on that journey of creating a really high quality apprenticeship programme. Um, and if you're already excellent at, at it, then you have the benefit that you can, you know, you can get the accreditation that you can be publicly recognised as being an employer who offers excellence, um, which will help you attract the best talent to your organisation. Um, we are a not-for-profit organisation. Everything that we do is about fulfilling our purpose to make work better. And, I grew up in a council estate. My dad was an alcoholic. My mum had mental health problems. Earning and learning was my route out of poverty. Um, so I'm hugely passionate about creating that ladder for as many people as possible. And I think apprenticeship schemes are a fantastic way of both the employer getting benefits by creating a really skilled and committed workforce, but also doing 
good for society overall by creating much more opportunities. So that's why I'm passionate that we at Investors and People help raise the quality of apprenticeship schemes as much as we possibly can um, and help as many organisations as possible start on that journey. Thanks, Paul. That was a, a great introduction. And um, I'm sure we can post in the chat as well a link to our website if you'd like to read a little bit more about the framework. Um, so Anna, tell us a little bit more about London Progression Collaboration. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so we are uh, a startup initiative, also uh, not-for-profit, and we are piloting a kind of flexible business service approach to generating new apprenticeships for low-paid Londoners. So a lot of what Paul was just saying about the, the, the huge potential of apprenticeships to make a real difference for people um, perhaps entering the workplace in, in low paid work or with low levels of prior qualifications. It's that potential of apprenticeships that we're really seeking to harness. Um, we are being incubated by IPPR, who are the Institute for Public Policy Research, um, who are better known as a think tank, but have a bit of a track record in incubating initiatives like this, which offer a, a kind of practical solution to some of the challenges that their research has identified. Um, and we're delivering the initiative in partnership with the Greater London Authority through the support of the Mayor of London and with financial support from JP Morgan. And all of that funding means that the support that we offer to businesses is available totally free of charge. Um, and we exist because we believe that apprenticeships can address two key challenges. So the progression barriers experienced by individuals in low paid work. We know if you enter the workplace having gone to university, got a degree, maybe a master's, your employer will probably um, invest more money in training you. If you enter the workplace um, in uh, low paid work or with low levels of prior qualifications, that's really unlikely to be the case. And that's, you know, amongst many reasons why people experience such barriers to progression. Um, and on the flip side of that, we also know that there are really key skills gaps affecting some key sectors, um, which, you know, then you hear that London has the lowest uh, rate of apprenticeship starts in the country. And you think actually apprenticeships are a fantastic opportunity to address both those challenges at once. Um, the core focus of our work since COVID hit in March has been on a campaign called Reskilling the Recovery, um, through which we're delivering a levy transfer service for Greater London. Um, and there are similar schemes operating, uh, particularly through some of the other mayoral authorities in Greater Manchester and in the West Midlands. Um, and since we launched that campaign in June, we've secured pledges of unspent apprenticeship levy funds totaling over £2.5 million now from businesses including Amazon, American Express and Reed. And we've had requests for levy transfer funding from small businesses of around £2 million now. And I think we've been so delighted that even in such challenging times for businesses, um, you know, both those who are very, very um, severely affected by the impact of COVID themselves, but also those who are just going through a period of such turbulence and uncertainty to be able to support the creation of new apprenticeship opportunities right now um, is a real privilege. Um, and we also then work with businesses of all sizes to support apprenticeship staff with everything from apprenticeship strategy support right through to very practical hands-on help for, for businesses perhaps without their own in-house HR or London and development specialism to navigate the apprenticeship system for the first time. Just to build on Anna's point there about the skills gap, I mean, prior to COVID we were all worried about there being massive skills gaps and skills shortages um, and if you look back at the, the government research over the last 10 or 15 years we have had persistent skills gaps um, in engineering and any STEM related occupations, digital um, and hospitality as well. There's always been a shortage of chefs um, and these persistent skills gaps will come back. Um, and now is a great time to invest in bringing in apprentices so that your organisation is prepared for the, the inevitable upturn that we'll have once the vaccines etc kick in and what we learned from the last recession big recession after the financial crash is the organizations that invested in their workforce during that recessionary period we had the capacity and capability to take advantage of the upturn when it came um, whereas if you haven't invested in the capacity and capability of workforce during this period then you're going to be fighting with everyone else for, this, for the lack of skills that will be out there in the market. And you'll find it much harder and much more expensive to bring that on board. So it may not see, it might sound counterintuitive that now's the right time to invest, but it absolutely is because you've got, you know, a labour market out there that's got lots of talent in it that you can attract in. 
particularly young people coming out of the education system, whether it be further higher education or um, school system, to bring them in, to nurture them and develop them, to help your organisation develop and grow as the, as the economy picks up. So it's a perfect time to invest. Fantastic. Thanks both. So we'll, we'll just pause now for another poll um, and then we'll go into more detail about how you can take advantage of the levy, um, what that is and some more top tips. Um, but if I just open up the poll now, thank you. Um, and we're just asking you how many people you employ, just so we can make the next section as relevant as possible for you. And um, if you are very speedy and you quickly fill in the poll, if you want to pop in any questions into the Q&A section, um, based on what you've just heard from Paul and Anna, please feel free to do so. There's a couple of quick questions about levy transfer that I might just I saw that, yeah. while we're waiting, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, quick primer on levy transfer funding, um, which is that organisations who pay into the apprenticeship levy, so those with a, a salary bill of over £3 million, pounds, um, are allowed in part of the funding rules to transfer up to 25% of uh, their levy to other organisations, um, usually smaller businesses who either don't pay the levy themselves or who um, are paying a, a relatively low level and which perhaps can't support the, um, the volume of apprenticeships that they would like to offer within their business. Um, so it's a great opportunity for large businesses to um, do something really constructive with any unspent levy funds that uh, they have. And for small businesses, accessing that funding means that 100% of the costs of um, apprenticeship training and assessment are covered by that funding. So it takes small businesses out of the, the need to um, use the government's co-investment scheme. Um, and you know, on some of the more uh, expensive apprenticeship standards, particularly around digital, around construction, that 5% for a, a smaller business can be a really significant barrier. Um, to accessing apprenticeships um, so it's you know it's a kind of win-win situation really. Thanks for that Anna and do you do you have any kind of like real life examples you could take us through maybe about the impact that it's made for small businesses? Yeah absolutely um, trying to pick a good one for you um, I think so we've had um, we've had a really good example um with uh, an ethical food retailer um, who are a small levy payer themselves. They are um, a growing business. They have a real focus on recruiting locally in London um, within their communities and on upskilling their staff um, to, to kind of progress into management positions and beyond. Um, and although they pay some levy and uh, using apprenticeships already, that levy wasn't enough to support them as they grew as a business. Um, so they've been able to use levy transfer from one of our levy donors to, um, to kind of grow those programs um, and particularly to offer the kind of first step on a leadership and management um, pathway for their staff into supervisory roles. And as they've actually, they've um, acquired another business recently um, and they're using that apprenticeship program to kind of unify the culture between those two organisations as well in terms of leadership and management, which I think is, you know, it's not only supporting staff progression, but it's really enabling um, that organisation to grow in a way which is really effective for them. Um, and then uh, another another really lovely example um, in the social care sector recently, um, uh, uh, to a, um, a social care provider who are uh, a social enterprise, um, so running on that basis, um, and uh, you know, are finding the the demand on their budgets from the kind of extra kind of COVID secure requirements, you know, a real drain. So the budgets really, really tight at the moment in a sector which is under so much pressure. Um, and have been able to access levy transfer from one of our donors to, um, to offer some starter level roles to bring people into the business, but also to, to upskill um, a lady who had worked in social care before, had moved out of the sector due to um, some health issues and had come back to the sector at the beginning of the COVID crisis, wanting to, to kind of get back into working in social care. Um, and wasn't really expecting, you know, as a slightly older woman in the workforce, wasn't really expecting to be offered training to progress her career at that point. And this apprenticeship is, you know, is the opportunity to progress into, into management and supervisory roles that she kind of thought she wasn't going to get. And that, you know, that employer is so pleased to be able to offer and really wouldn't have been able to do so without accessing that levy funding. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Anna. Um, two, fun, two brilliant examples there, and I hope that's kind of shed some light for those that ask those questions in the Q&A. Um, maybe we just close off the poll now and, and see what sort of spread we've got. Interesting. Okay, so I, I can see we've got right. a pretty big chunk of um, SMEs on the call today, um, and a couple of the larger ones as well, 500 plus and 1000 plus. So um, in light of that kind of spread, Anna, do you have any further tips on, on how to kind of use the levy transfer process, both for the kind of smaller end and the larger end of employers? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'll, I'll start at the larger employer end. Um, and I think, you know, for the conversations that we have, thinking about levy transfer is all about that being a part of a really successful apprenticeship strategy. So just as, you know, any business's apprenticeship strategy with their own levy should be intentional, it should have clear objectives that are related to the, the business's overall strategy and to kind of workforce planning, etc. So, uh, you know, thinking about what to do with unspent levy and engaging in levy transfer should similarly be kind of related to that business's objectives and strategy. And so the conversations we're having with um, those who are doing levy transfer with us tend to be around, um, you know, whether there are particular skills areas that they're interested in investing their levy funds in, um, whether that's because it's kind of uh, within their particular domain, um, or whether it's, you know, areas where they know there are skills gaps which have a real impact on society and actually they feel a, um, a kind of CSR type um, motivation for, for doing that. We have conversations with businesses who are interested in supporting particular underrepresented groups, um, either to access the labour market um, or into particular sectors. Um, and that's often aligned with work that they themselves are doing on a very practical basis as well. And we have other organisations who have perhaps got a particular connection with a local area. So, you know, either where they have, you know, a large HQ building um, and feel that actually levy transfer is a great way to um, support businesses more widely in that area um, or to, um, you know, where they perhaps have done work with local schools and actually see this levy transfer as a way to sort of expand on involvement within a particular community. So lots of ways in which large businesses can think strategically about how they don't want to use those unspent levy funds. I think the challenge for um, many, even the, the kind of largest corporate um, levy payers, is the capacity to then do something about that. Um, that's where we heard, you know, during the feasibility study that came before our existence and what we've heard um, throughout um, the, the year or so that we've been speaking to businesses is the kind of need for that um, sort of brokering and support service and that's what we're able to offer in London and what other um, other projects are, are seeking to do in other parts of the country um, and so I think looking at that support is is a really good idea you know some businesses have great connections with potential levy recipients and are doing it themselves fantastically well um, but that is often a, a burden that's really challenging um, and then for small uh, non-levy payers um, I think um, you know again the starting point um, should be that kind of uh, workforce planning just asking those questions as to you know what where do we need skills now where do we think we're going to need them in three years and where do we need to be building that talent pipeline where are we expecting maybe a couple of people to retire or leave the business where we can think about how we might fill those gaps um, all those kinds of questions. I think workforce planning sounds a bit kind of scary and off-putting, but actually it doesn't need to be. Um, kind of a simple set of questions, I think, will kind of guide businesses to, to good answers. Um, and then I think that, you know, alongside accessing levy transfer funding um, through, you know, um, organisations like ourselves and the other projects who are doing this work, I think the other really important thing is the choice of apprenticeship provider to make that a success. Um, and, uh, you know, I think anyone involved in apprenticeships will have kind of seen the good, the bad and the ugly of that. And I would say on that, the good is very, very good and it's worth spending some time at finding really good apprenticeship provision. And that's not just about, for me, finding a list of kind of recommended providers. It's about thinking what your business needs, 
thinking how your apprenticeship vision needs to be aligned with the way you work and with the values and ethos of your business and really um, kind of finding a provider who will work with you in the way that you need them to. Um, and, and that provision is out there. It can just sometimes take a little bit of looking for, but you know, that's that's something where we, we work really hard to introduce um, small businesses we're working with to a range of providers so they can see what that range looks like and make the decision that's right for their business about finding that really high quality provision. Right. That's some, some great, really great advice there. I could see you nodding, Paul, throughout. Was there anything that you wanted to add? No, um, I was just really impressed by <laughs> Anna's depth of knowledge of that. Because I, um, I used to work in skills policy and I know how complicated um, the, whole, the whole system can be. So to be able to encapsulate it and uh, clearly describe it there is a, is a skill in itself, Anna. So <laughs> congratulations to you for that. I might come and ask you some more questions myself. <laughs> um, yeah, I, mean, I think, I think the, the only thing that I would say to build on that is we need, we need to make sure that the, the programmes that we do have are of a high quality. Um, and, you know, we've all heard the, the horror stories um, about things that went wrong when, you know, the, there was a, a drive for volume of apprenticeships instead of making sure that there were volume and there was quality as well. And that's where I think that we can add value to this process by helping organisations understand what a good scheme looks like and helping them assess themselves against a framework that's, you know, approved by the Department of Education, um, has been signed up by Ofsted, Institute for Apprenticeships, you know, all the, I know the list all the stakeholders because it would take up half an hour, but as, you know, and it helped particularly smaller employers because we know that you generally don't have HR support until you get to sort of 60 to 80 employees. Um, and an apprenticeship scheme can, an apprentice can offer a huge amount of value to, to particularly smaller employers. So what we think we can add value is we've got a framework that can help you understand where you are now and where you, where you can progress to in order to improve the, the quality of the programme. And that will have a direct impact on the experience of the apprentice, but also how productive and successful they are in your organisation, which then has an impact on your overall productivity. Um, so, you know, I think this is why this uh, event is so important, because between the two of us, the two organisations were coming at it from different angles, but complementary angles where we can both together help more employers um, take on apprentices and also make sure that that apprenticeship experience is a good one and a quality one for the apprentice, for the employer. And as we said earlier, the huge positive impacts that that can have in society overall. Wonderful. So I've just got one final question for you both, and then we'll dive into the Q&A section. Um, so my, my final question is, what would be your top tips for an organisation considering hiring apprentices? So maybe a, a kind of place to start. Um, I'll go to you first, Anna. Right. So <laughs> I think um, three things for me. Um, so know why you're doing it, have really clear objectives that are kind of rooted in the needs of the business and make sure that that is widely understood and that you have the buy-in that you need, just as with any other business initiative. Um, choose your provider with care, as I mentioned earlier, and I think do your bit to make sure that that apprentice has a really great experience. I think um, people focus a lot on the provider and thinking about the 20% off the job time. That means that 80% of that apprentice's experience and learning is taking place on the job within the workplace um, so I think thinking about that experience thinking about um, you know mentoring support coaching support peer buddying all those kinds of things that can um, can really support someone to to kind of thrive in an apprenticeship are really important as well. Fantastic thank you over to you Paul for your top tips on where to yeah. get started. So I would I would just really building on what Anna said, because I 100% agree, our research showed as well that, and this is reflected in our framework, you have to have the business case right up front about why you're doing it, what's the business case for it, and really understand that in detail, um, because that will then determine the action that you take after that. The, the other area that I think is really important is the apprentice's experience will be heavily dictated by how they're managed. So you need to make sure that you've trained your managers in order and supported your managers in order to help them support the apprentice 
Um, and again, that's something that we explore in detail in, in our framework is how do you make sure that you've got this, the support infrastructure in the organisation around that person so that they can thrive in, in the environment of your workplace. The other one I would say is, um, and I know this from, from my time in skills policy, is one of the things that we found in the research that we did is that quite often, particularly smaller firms, just recruit from their own networks. Um, and generally, it's somebody who knows someone. I think what, what we would, and I would particularly, given my background, we want to encourage is employers trying to widen the, the uh, diversity of the uh, potential labour markets that they, that they attract from, because a more diverse workforce is equally a more productive workforce as well. So widening the pool in which um, you search for potential apprentices. And as Anna says, a really good training provider will we'll help you do that, will help you find um, the right kind of candidates from a diverse background. So um, I think that's another important area as well. And then the third one is to celebrate the success. You know, it's we don't, being British, particularly being Scottish, we don't, well, apart from last Thursday, but we've went back to normal again in the last two games, but we should celebrate the success of organisations who do this really well. And there should be a, there should be, there should be a stigma for not doing this because the whole of society needs it. But equally, there should be huge recognition for employers who really do do this well. Um, and that's something that we will that we will be bringing to the table is making sure that we shout for the rooftops employers that have really signed up to doing this exceptionally well, so that that becomes a standard that everyone is expected to achieve. Thank you. I love that. I think the more celebration we can fit in in these days, the better. So um, what I move on to now is our Q&A. Um, and I, this is often my favorite part of a webinar because you get to go kind of really practical and see what questions are out there. Um, so I'm gonna start off with one from Jen. Um, I think this is a really good question. Are there any hints and tips that you could give us for starting an apprentice during COVID restrictions given, so, uh, sorry, given that so many of us are now working from home or virtually? So any top tips for, for remote um, support of apprentices? I'll jump in. Um, I think, um, you know, I think, you know, largely the same as with with other team members and other employees and particularly new starters, you know, so much comes down to communication um, and ensuring there are, you know, really regular opportunities to talk both one to one and as a team. Um, and you know all of all of these things are trickier um, when so many people are working remotely or in other kind of unusual um, unusually restricted ways. Um, but I think you know that communication is absolutely key. Um, making sure that communication is in place, um, kind of three way communication with the provider is really key. Um, and I think, you know, all, all the things that um, I'm a trained mental health first aider, you know, things I would kind of take from that training um, around, you know, just looking at signs that someone might be struggling and not being afraid to kind of ask those questions is really important. Um, uh, you know, having, having that mentoring and coaching in place and kind of peer to peer buddying if someone is particularly if they're new to new to work altogether or new to your workplace. Um, and, you know, I think making sure what people need at this particular time is really important. And that might be kind of physical equipment to be able to work from home. That might be support getting a faster internet connection to make, um, make work happen. Um, and it might, be, it might be more emotional support, um, you know, all, all kinds of things that people need at the moment and having really clear and open channels of communication um, to enable people to ask clearly for what they need, um, I think is really important. Um, I think one of the things that's perhaps trickier at the moment is kind of um, being clear, you know, what work people are doing and how they're managing their time and all those things. And I think, you know, the, the kind of great online collaboration tools that I think make that kind of objective setting and tracking um, a bit a bit easier. Uh, definitely kind of recommend getting people kind of up to speed with using some of those. So um, we really like Miro board as a way of kind of managing um, interactive conversations across the team. But there are loads of things out there to to help with that. And I think um, I think getting getting people using those tools to help kind of really collaborate, even if they're new to a team and have never actually sat in a room with anybody before is really important. I have some really great practical tips there. Anything to add to that, Paul? No, I, I think 
um, a lot a lot of the fundamentals are the same as you know we're we're finding where every um, um, colleague at the moment if, if people are if it's an office based environment you know utilizing the technology and making sure that the regular contact and communication is there. Um, I mean, but for a young person, starting work is daunting at the best of times, but starting work when you actually don't physically have the opportunity to meet anyone must be incredibly daunting. Um, so I think in that scenario, you've got to dial up and overcompensate above what you would normally do to make sure that you've triple double checked um, that that person is OK and that you've got the infrastructure and support mechanisms around about them so that they don't... So that they don't um, so they don't fail because you know induction is so important as we know from the wider work that we do induction is so important to an employee's experience of that workplace and if they get off to a bad start it can take them quite a long time to recover so really focusing on that induction and making sure that the support mechanisms are there is a key thing as, as far as i'm concerned i think there's another important point about checking what you know knowing where to signpost and checking support resources provider has in place because you know yeah. whilst you know larger organizations will have the kind of employee support programs that people can get um confidential support from you know smaller businesses without that actually there will be support that should be available through through many providers um for people who might be having a, a tough time um coping with the current current situation so i think you know making making it your business to know where to go for support if that's needed yeah. is important and we have lots of information about employee well-being on our website. So, you know, if you want to go there, there's lots of resources around about employee well-being um, if you want to use that as a starting point. Absolutely. Thanks, Bo. Um, so another really interesting question here that's come through from Carl Johnson. Um, he says, do you feel a stigma still exists within apprenticeships, particularly with age? Um, his impression is that this is changing, but what are your thoughts? I'll go first. I can. I'm. Um, I've got a teenage son who's uh, 16 in February, and I know talking to other parents that the whole, the whole thing about you know wanting your kid to go to university is not as strong a driver as it used to be. Because um, what they're evaluating is well, what's the career prospects? Um, and I've seen it with my nephew who's 19 now. A lot of his friends who did academically did very well. If they saw a high quality apprenticeship scheme, many of them chose that over and above uh, the, the academic route. So I do think it is changing. Um, I think there's a huge amount of work still to do to um, influence teachers because they came generally through an academic route and that's kind of, and quite often they went from a academia back into academia. So they've not got, and I'm not saying, no, damning them all by this, but a high percentage of them, um, that's their kind of mindset because that's what they know. So that I still think there's a huge amount of work to do to to influence teachers about that, um, and that it's not like a setting class option. It's actually for many people, it's it's a brilliant option. Um, equally with parents, but just anecdotally, my experience is I think the views of parents are are changing, and that stigma is for a good apprenticeship scheme. Um, it's definitely definitely changing, but you need to be able to demonstrate to the parents that it is a good scheme. Um, you need to have what some way that they'll recognise that and be comfortable that that's um, been ind independently verified. Brilliant. And Anna, any views on stigma around apprenticeships? I definitely agree with with Paul's comments. Um, I think you know, I think there has definitely been a shift, but there's still a, a reasonable distance to travel in many ways. Um, I think you know, just as a as a kind of uh, yardstick, my my old school, you know, has for many many years celebrated the university destinations that um, that people achieve. Last year was the first year I saw them celebrating some people going on to um, to apprenticeships, and I think you know that's that's a kind of marker of change that um, I certainly celebrated um and I think you know there are there are some great organizations who are doing really important work to to try and kind of keep this shift happening and speed it up which I think is really important I think the the careers advice and guidance piece is is really crucial um and and absolutely the the kind of uh, the need to be um kind of changing opinions with parents as well um, I think you know the more the more great storytelling we can all share, um, the the better, really. 
Absolutely. Thank you. So um, going back to the, the pot of questions that I've got in front of me, um, I've got a couple of here that are specific uh, kind of investors in people questions. So going to you, Paul, um, someone's asked, as an investors in people accredited company already, how slash where can we access the recommended apprenticeship framework? Yeah, if you, if you go to the investors in people website, um, there's details of the framework there. Um, I'd be happy to have a conversation where you um, I'm happy to provide my contact details through through IPPR or get them posted on, on here. Um, my email address is paul.devoy at investorsandpeople.com. So please reach out to me. I'd be happy to talk to you about it in more detail. Thanks, Paul. And um, hot on the heels of that, we've had another question come through from Jeanette. Um, just asking, what value do you think the practitioners for We Invest in Apprentices will be able to add in supporting employers on their management of apprentices journey over time? Yeah, so we have a, a, a team of well, across the UK, nearly 300 um, registered practitioners who work with us, who go in and support organisations. So they would they would be more than delighted to give any employer who wants some advice on their apprenticeship scheme um, and also talk to them about how they can work with our framework and give them support in that journey. So, um, yeah, we've got a huge pool of people out there on the ground, geographically spread right across the UK, who can, who can support employers. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and now a couple of levy questions for you, Anna. Um, so the first question is, is it possible for an intermediary to act as a levy recipient for a range of SMEs? It's not currently, no, um, which is, you know, one role that, that we would be, be really interested in, but doesn't currently exist. So levy transfer currently has to go directly from uh, the levy payers um, apprenticeship service account into the um, SME or recipient organisations uh, account. Thank you. And um, again, hot on the heels of that, we've had a just a quick question come through. Anna, do you facilitate levy funding transfer? So within Greater London, yes. Um, and as I said, there are, are similar projects um, in some of the other mayoral authorities doing um, broadly similar work to, to that that we're doing as well. So yeah, facilitating that relationship and supporting the actual practical steps of transfer is one of the main things that we're doing. Perfect. Thanks, Anna. Um, and a question here from Paul Burns. Um, so he says, we've developed a range of entry level routes into the civil engineering and infrastructure sectors. Um, demand from contractors in growth sectors such as traffic management, water, highways and utilities is very high to develop new high quality apprenticeships due to the highly regulated nature of work in these sectors. Would it be possible to develop pilots in London with a view to a national rollout? I, I can't see any reason why not. <laughs> Absolutely, um, yeah. I, I think we'd be definitely kind of interested in discussing what that might look like in practice and, and seeing if it's something we could support with. Brilliant. Um, so that's actually all of the questions that we had in our Q&A bank. Um, so last chance if you want to pop anything through in there. But I, th I think I probably speak for everybody on the call when I say I found this hugely interesting and very enlightening indeed. Um, were there any kind of closing remarks that either of you wanted to make on the topic? I'll go to you first, Paul. Yeah, the other thing I would say is, um, you know, we've everyone's had um, a tough year um, and we've got to build back better than we did before and we've got an opportunity to do that. One of the ways that we can do that is to invest in our workforce and make sure that our organisations have got the skills and capabilities for whatever, um, you know, the, the upturn looks like. And I think apprenticeships is a brilliant way of doing that, um, speaking I didn't do a formal apprenticeship, but I did a form of an apprenticeship. It transformed my life. So you can do good by transforming people's lives. You can do good for your business by improving the capacity and capability of your workforce. And you're going to make a positive impact on your business by improved productivity and make a positive impact on society. So I can't, can't think of a reason not to do it. Paul, well, that's a great summary. And um, we've actually just had one last question come through, um, and that is, can mature people uh, become apprentices? Uh, yeah. Yes, the apprentices are for people of, of any age um, and also available at um, any level from level two, which is uh, kind of GCSE equivalent, right through to uh, the equivalent of master's level qualifications. So, um, so whilst I think there is an association with kind of school leavers and new entrants to, to the workforce, 
um, you know, both, uh, both kind of lower level apprenticeships, perhaps people who might be looking at change sectors um, are very much available to, to uh, more mature workers as well, but also, um, you know, those opportunities to upskill um, within, within the work that people are doing. Um, and that's, you know, I think larger organisations who are kind of thinking strategically about how to spend their levy are often offering opportunities right through those levels and kind of meeting all those different needs. Great, thank you. And um, any kind of final points, Anna, uh, before we close up? A little bit early, actually. I think that's an extra five, ten minutes on people's days. Brilliant. I'll be quick and let everyone get <laughs> fresh air or extra lunchtime. Um, I think, um, you know, I think we hear a lot of conversation um, if you're kind of keeping an eye on anything apprenticeship related about the kind of challenges in the system and the problems with the levy um, and all these kinds of things. And I think some of that makes it really easy to overlook the power of apprenticeships, um, which, you know, Paul's been very eloquent in describing. And also, you know, I think my view and kind of some of the rationale behind the work we're doing is that actually some of those challenges aren't necessarily about kind of policy solutions from government. Actually, if we think that more of the apprenticeship spending needs to be going to lower levels of apprenticeships for younger people and for people needing to change sectors and for people who perhaps uh, have lower levels of prior qualifications, then actually we can take that into our own hands and we can do that. One of the ways we're doing that is by the way we're kind of directing levy transfer funding, but that's that's kind of something that we are all able to, to kind of rise to that challenge and think where, where we think apprenticeships right now in this really challenging context can make the biggest difference both to individuals and to businesses. Fantastic. Thank you. It's very inspiring um, and a great place to finish up, I think. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us today and, and taking an hour out of your day to, to listen to us talk about this. Um, and please do get in touch with any of us if you'd like further information or use those links in the chat. Um, but have a, a very wonderful day, everyone. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Anna. Thank thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for joining.